So Dr. Kang, you had mentioned previously that there are five stages of chronic kidney disease. Approximately at what stage do signs and symptoms start to appear in CKD patients? Could you sort of give us the overview of sort of what the clinical uh, appearance is uh, in, in addition to sort of what we're seeing, you know, based on lab values? Sure, yeah, this, this can actually be quite variable. Um, a lot of times the signs and symptoms of chronic kidney disease are very dependent on what type of disease they have. So what is their underlying chronic kidney disease from? Do they have you know, a nephrotic syndrome where, the, where they develop edema very early in the disease, even as a CKD stage one? So really we can see these symptoms at any stage in chronic kidney disease, but you know, generally we start to see some symptoms with you know, phosphate dysregulation, acid-base uh, dysregulation, anemia, et cetera, around at least stage three, four, and five. So that's when we start to see that you know, where we're starting patients on a lot of other medications to help control their phosphorus, control the acid base, and then, you know, diuretics to control the edema. And then, you know, the uremic symptoms, more so the poor appetite and fatigue, we generally see in the later stages of CKD, more so in stage four and five. Um, but as I said, you know, it can be quite variable. And so uh, sometimes we do see symptoms a little bit earlier on. Thanks. If, if we turn our attention to some of the mechanistic uh, issues involving uh, depression in CKD patients, certainly the psychological impact of this type of diagnosis uh, with the attendant requirements to alterations in lifestyle uh, can easily be understood to have such an impact on folks. Um, it, it's quite a diagnosis to receive given the, uh, the time and attention it takes on behalf of patients and families to attend to their, their primary underlying illness. Um, however, there are additional either biological as well as uh, psychological or behavioral features that can contribute uh, to, the, to the manifestation of major depressive disorder in these patients. And studies would suggest that the mechanisms of depression in chronic kidney disease, which is um, you know, obviously similar to other chronic diseases, can be divided into these two different mechanisms. Uh, if we turn our attention to some of the behavioral mechanisms, certainly the overall burden of the disease, as we've been discussing, the, the impact on their life, the way in which patients and families need to adjust their schedule and, uh, and to make changes in their, in their work life, in their home life. Um, Non-adherence to self-care can be a, an issue for anybody uh, struggling with depression and anyone dealing with a chronic illness. Uh, so especially an illness that requires such strict attention to personal care uh, can, can really be impacted by the presence of depression. The lack of social support can be seen. This can be a very isolating illness for some patients. I think some patients feel uh, ill-equipped on how to talk about uh, either depression or chronic kidney disease to other friends. And so they may fear becoming a burden or they may feel socially uncomfortable around others. And other people honestly may have a hard time uh, knowing how best to offer support to friends or to loved ones. So it can unfortunately have an isolating uh, effect leading to a, a relative impairment in their quality of life. Uh, and a number of adverse health behaviors as, as people cut themselves off from those around them, they become less and less likely to do the things that they need to do to stay healthy. From the biological side, beyond just the psychological impact of the diagnosis, there are a number of just sort of nuts and bolts type of uh, physiologic changes that can uh, increase the depressive burden. So the medical comorbidities that go along with chronic kidney disease can also contribute their own individual risks to depression. The whole uh, issue around inflammation, as we now recognize that uh, depression is not just a neck up disease, but it's a whole body disease. Uh, including uh, various changes in the body's immune and, and inflammatory system. We see alterations in autonomic activity, you know, these neurotransmitters that psychiatrists like myself like to talk about uh, certainly travel below the level of the neck. And, and while we call these substances neurotransmitters, other call, others call them pressor substances or others call them substances that affect urinary tone or GI motility. So, so anything that we're changing uh, with the, with medicines that are used to treat uh, these uh, these conditions can have an impact on other body systems. Uh, certainly, we can see hormonal abnormalities that occur in the setting of chronic kidney disease that can contribute to alterations in mood and anxiety. Uh, 
uh, again, leading to uh, a significant impact on their overall quality of life. And there are also uh, a host of other factors, other primary factors, such as the genetic vulnerability that people may have to one or both classes of disorders that can contribute differential risk to the development of these conditions. Okay, thank you. Next, uh, we'll talk about depression in CKD and the risk factors. In CKD, risk factors for depression include younger age, female, non-white race or ethnicity, lower household income, or the presence of comorbid conditions. Um, and as I had touched on a little bit earlier, the prevalence of depression actually increases with stage of CKD. So the lower their GFR gets, and in fact, uh, proteinuria area greater than one gram. In end-stage renal disease, coping with the long-term nature of renal replacement therapy may lead to depression. Other factors that predispose these patients to developing depression include loss of a primary role in their occupation or family. I see this quite frequently. Uh, oftentimes, patients lose their role as the primary caregiver for individuals in their family. Next is decreased physical and or sexual function decline in cognitive skills. More so than just that, um, there are a lot of other patient stressors that can actually contribute to development of uh, depression and chronic kidney disease or ESRD. These patients have dietary constraints, time restrictions, financial constraints, changes in employment um, can also be a significant contribution. Additionally, you know, we have a lot of patients who have to be on a lot of new medications. They experience new medication side effects. And of course, as I had touched on earlier, the, these patients tend to uh, be a little bit more aware of their mortality. And so a lot of that can contribute to depression uh, in these patients. Major depressive disorder in chronic kidney disease is associated with poor outcomes. Depression is associated with an increased risk for adverse clinical outcomes and poor health in patients with chronic kidney disease. Depressive symptoms such as low motivation, impaired concentration, and apathy can significantly affect treatment adherence of patients in ESRD. So a lot of times when these patients have you know, low motivation, they tend to miss dialysis treatments. Uh, eventually that leads to fluid overload. Oftentimes they're in the hospital and this impacts their quality of life and eventually mortality. So a decrease in treatment compliance is one of the potential pathways through which depression may affect mortality and morbidity in patients with late stage CKD. Depression, more so than clinical and sociodemographic variables taken together, has been shown to negatively impact health-related quality of life in chronic kidney disease patients. So you'll see this figure to the right, uh, major depressive disorder in chronic kidney disease, and really it's just a circle that um, essentially perpetuates itself. Major depressive disorder in CKD leads to increased morbidity and mortality in these patients. We know that there's an increase um, in healthcare utilization, uh, not only to take care of these patients, but you know, when we know they are suffering from depression and not adhering to their treatment regimen, um, you know, they're, they're increasing their rates of hospitalization. And again, that's more healthcare utilization. And of course, overall it decreases their quality of life and will, again, lead to higher mortality. Dr. Bojab, if a patient is suspected of having depression, how can a nephrologist identify locations locally to refer patients? So it's a good question. You know, given the, the relative paucity of uh, psychiatrists and other mental health uh, professionals around the country, it probably is a good thing to, to, to have some names of go-to referral sources in your back pocket. Uh, and to try to establish a relationship. I know I always value my relationship with our local nephrologist as we're uh, frequently working collaboratively to manage patients, either patients with chronic kidney disease or my, my patients who may be treated with medicines that have particular impact on, uh, on renal function. Uh, so it's, it's not something that you want to leave to the last minute and be scrambling to, to try to make a referral. So I think it's uh, good, as it is in so many other areas, to establish a good referral relationship. And keep in mind that we're not talking about just psychiatrists, but uh, also psychologists, social workers, advanced practice nurses, physician assistants who specialize in, in mental health issues. So to you know, make sure that you're availing yourself of all of the resources in your community, since there's not enough of any one type of these resources to go around. Also, don't overlook primary care physicians as being quite helpful. Uh, although a number of patients certainly do wind up being referred to psychiatrists, 
the bulk of major depression in the country is actually treated by primary care physicians. So depending on his or her own level of interest or expertise, uh, certainly our primary care colleagues can be a great resource uh, for the evaluation and management of, uh, of depression in this setting. If I may uh, ask a little further um, on this topic, I find that a lot of our patients on dialysis, you know, they already experience the time burden of three times a week dialysis. Oftentimes they're seeing multiple other specialists. Do you find that um, their compliance with, you know, in terms of coming to their appointments, is that an issue, you know, in terms of adding another specialist or appointment to their already busy uh, schedule? I, I think it certainly can, uh, can be. I think anytime we're asking patients to um, devote such a chunk of their their time each week towards um, you know addressing their own chronic health care issues it makes it uh, harder for them to be motivated to attend to each and everything so we try to really work with uh, with patients with chronic disease especially with our chronic kidney disease patients in uh, being flexible uh, understanding that we may have to work around their dialysis schedules under being understanding if they need to call and cancel a, uh, an appointment because although they had dialysis the day before you know maybe their volumes weren't uh, quite right and maybe they're just not feeling like they can make it out of the house we also try whenever possible or whenever permissible uh, to make ourselves available for appointments via uh, via phone or via telemedicine services which uh, are oftentimes uh, really appreciated by patients who uh, oftentimes have a hard time predicting how they're going to feel physically one day to the next. So sometimes just letting these patients know up front that those are options and alternatives, I think can help with overall adherence to treatment to let them know that you understand uh, the the burden that, that that they carry having to deal with dialysis and that you're willing to you know do everything you can to make yourself more available and and to remove any obstacles you can for their ability to, to receive care. Great, thank you, I appreciate it. All right, so next we'll touch on the cycle between depression and ESRD. And as I mentioned, this is a cycle. So um, these, all these factors tend to affect each other. The interactions between depression and chronic kidney disease are dynamic and multifactorial. Depression possibly affects medical outcomes in ESRD patients through modification of immunologic and stress responses, impact on nutritional status, reduction of compliance access to prescribed dialysis and medical regimens. Uh, so we know that um, there are pro-inflammatory cytokines that are upregulated and act as neuromodulators that can actually mediate effects of depression. Um, in turn, this can affect um, the individual in terms of compliance issues, as I had mentioned. Um, affect their dietary compliance and affect uh, their compliance to the dialysis prescription. Eventually, not only does this lead to uh, more hospitalizations, um, et cetera, but in, in terms of chronic kidney disease with poor compliance, uh, CKD tends to progress much quicker to the point where they do end up on dialysis um, a lot sooner than otherwise. And then again, you know, the, the more CKD progresses um, and in ESRD as well, we know that pro-inflammatory cytokines are also upregulated. So again, as with many other uh, cycles, this one also tends to perpetuate itself. It really can become a, a vicious cycle, as you mentioned, because we're increasingly aware of the impact of these other uh, hormonal and, uh, and inflammatory mediated processes that appear to have a, an increasingly important role in the pathogenesis of, of depression and, and uh, other psychiatric conditions. Uh, and unfortunately, the, the worse the depression gets, uh, it can feed back into further dysregulations of, of these symptoms. So things really unfortunately can snowball uh, and it can become a real chicken or the egg uh, type of situation. Sure, and, and along the same lines, you know, as, as the inflammatory state uh, kind of perpetuates itself in ESRD as well, that also leads to increased atherosclerosis. So those individuals are also developing cardiovascular disease amongst all these other uh, medical issues that they already deal with. So um, Dr. Bojrap, could the stigma around mental illness be a barrier to treatment? It, it certainly can. I, I would love to be able to tell you that this is, is no longer an issue, but we were, we were talking about this when I was in my residency and I assume we will still be having, unfortunately, some conversations about it when, I, when I'm ready to retire at some point. 
I will say that the issue of stigma around mental illness uh, has been getting progressively better. I think it's uh, it's such a well recognized thing. I think we just it's something we hear a lot more about now in the day to day news cycles. I think you see more prominent uh, people coming out and, and disclosing their own personal history of, of various psychiatric conditions, including depression. Uh, and that, that certainly helps. So I, I will say that uh, I think that this is less of a barrier than it was in the past, but certainly can still be a barrier. Unfortunately, it's not the, the, uh, an equal barrier to, every, to everyone. We see uh, different demographic groups that may have uh, a little bit more hesitancy to to seek mental health care from uh, for mental health care professionals, so I think it's important that we encourage our patients to um, to seek care where it's appropriate, but also to recognize that that may mean for an individual patient uh, not necessarily being referred to a psychiatrist, but they may feel more comfortable seeking counseling services through a church or a faith-based organization. Uh, they may uh, either feel more comfortable talking to somebody in terms of talk therapy and less comfortable with the idea of medications or vice versa. So sometimes spending just a couple of minutes to sort of test the water and, and get an understanding of, of what the patient's uh, feelings are uh, or their level of comfort in seeking this type of treatment uh, can be helpful. And I know when I'm meeting with patients, I usually try to describe uh, what we have to offer in terms of what we can do to support the treatment that they're seeking for their chronic kidney disease and explain the ways in which the things that we are trying to to work on with them uh, can sometimes uh, ultimately have a positive impact just not on how they're feeling and functioning uh, but this can also translate into uh, a better level of control of the progression of their kidney disease. Yeah, you know, in my experience, I actually see this quite a bit um, with some of my dialysis patients um, in terms of seeing the stigma. And um, I've had individuals before um, who actually have to sort of seek counseling services or see a psychiatrist or psychologist um, as a part of their pre-transplant workup. Um, and a lot of times they're they're pretty upset about it, uh, but they 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 tend to go through with it just so that they can um, move on in the transplant process. But I. I still see this uh, among a lot of my patients. Yeah, it cer certainly uh, cer certainly can be a, a factor with which we have to deal.